Welcome to our first WG Hub Live in 2021. Um, as part of our New Year series of special events on current topics, uh, today we're focusing on the Brexit trade deal uh, with some expert commentary on the complex area of fat and duties. So with the pandemic taking front page uh, and the focus taken away from the no deal scenario, we feel it's important not to ignore the fact that the businesses need to get an understanding of international trade rules post-Brexit. So with us only having seven days into the new trade arrangements, our presenters have a, a very little time to get to grips uh, with the information. But uh, however, we are delighted to welcome them today to have live. Um, they're going to bring some insight, hopefully, into how the import-export systems work uh, and to what extent uh, we, we, this will impact on the cost of international trade, hopefully. So um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Howard Marsh, uh, sales manager uh, from Descartes. Good morning. Good morning, Howard. Very welcome to you. Um, Howard has an extensive background in the freight industry. Um, looks like from the age of 16, uh, he started in Southampton and currently focuses on EMEA custom solutions and the Descartes systems products. Um, we also have with us today Simon Heath, Senior Account Executive at Descartes. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Simon um, is also with us and he's currently helping businesses transform their e-commerce, logistics, supply chain, delivery performance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, using uh, software solutions. Um, so we're going to hear a, a, a little presentation there uh, shortly. I'm also delighted that Charter Tax are back on WG Hub Live. Uh, and today we are privileged to have the company of Janet Pierce, uh, founder and principal at Charter Tax. Good morning, Janet. Thank you, Ian. Nice to see you. Good morning. Um, obviously, Janet has a very strong uh, technical background in the UK and international tax. Um, and hopefully she's going to you know, bring some insights, especially on VAT um, a bit later on. So um, a very warm welcome to all the regulars um, uh, who have joined us today and, and obviously for those who've joined our audience for the first time. So normal WG Hub Live uh, rules apply. So we will start the presentations in a moment and then we will have our normal uh, panel session in about say, 30, 40, 40 minutes uh, time. And, and then we'll pose the questions from the audience uh, until at the scheduled to end time of, of 11 uh, o'clock. So please ask your questions using the Q&A function and feel, feel free to use the uh, chat box for anything else. So I, I think we're kicking off with uh, Howard this morning. So uh, Howard, would you like to uh, share your screen and, and let's get started? Okay, just bear with. Well, good morning all. Um, so as, as was introduced there, I mean, uh, the, uh, the situation has unfortunately been sort of uh, thrust upon many people. Uh, the government really didn't uh, make it clear that deal or no deal, uh, a customs declaration was going to be required. Um, that message was somewhat swallowed, partly due to probably the COVID, but uh, not really strong enough, I think, out there. And uh, we've seen through our our um, industry a lot of people waiting for that deal was was announced um, and not necessarily being prepped for the need for a customs declaration because. Uh, you know, the good news is a deal has been struck, but that deal is really only to do with the um, requirements of customs duties um, and or VAT, et cetera. It's not um, to do with the ability to do the customs declaration, which is required because we have left the EU customs union. And so um, for a big area of our business is the customs declaration software. And uh, we have been, you know, as you would expect, uh, sort of swamped with uh, the need for that uh, build up to, to the end of the year and, and has continued into the new year. So just to sort of pick up on some of the, the, the main customs changes, as I say, the, uh, the situation is now that instead of something coming in from Japan or the US and requiring a customs declaration as it does today, um, also now the EU 27, as they are, now that we've left, um, also are required to submit a customs declaration whether you're importing into the UK or whether you're exporting to the EU 27 from the UK. We also have the added twist of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, 
which we, if we get a chance, we might touch on a little bit. So duty rates are good in the sense that the deal has said that there won't be uh, duty rates, but the custom declaration is still required to confirm the goods have come from where they've come from and what they are, etc., for the purposes of uh, statistics and for anti-smuggling. The UK have developed its own tariff, the customs tariff. This is based on the commodity code, um, which identifies the goods and then the rate of uh, duty and any other associated uh, information around it. Um, uh, that will then gradually, we imagine, become slightly different to the EU common tariff, which is what we've been using up until now. And then the free trade agreements, as you may remember from the news and the, and the stories around Brexit, we weren't allowed to negotiate while we were still members of the EU because that was an EU block negotiation. Um, but the UK have now started doing its own trade agreements with various countries and putting those and adopting those. Um, as with any free trade agreement, generally it doesn't cover every single item. Um, it covers certain particular areas because certain industries need to be protected. That can continues with trade uh, today, as it has always been really with trade barriers. Um, so don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that the duty rates will be zero and they can be reduced in some cases. And we have you know, trade agreements as we were with the likes of Switzerland when we were in the EU, uh, Turkey and Norway, for example. Um, and they have to qualify those agreements. They have to send a customs declaration in. They have to state that the goods are of origin of that country with a what's called a preference certificate. Um, and then they get their, their duty rate uh, zeroed or reduced um, and pay less. Um, for goods coming on the excise movement control system, it's quite a big change because com companies uh, you know, a whiskey distillery in Scotland were able to move their goods under what's called excise suspension all the way from Scotland, all the way down to Rome in Italy or Greece, etc. Uh, as one single movement under the customs union arrangements. And then the goods could sit there in an excise suspended state until such time as they went into home use, say, in, in Italy, for example, or Greece. Um, so there's a big change there for the industry. Uh, they've now got to export it effectively from the UK. Uh, and then make arrangements for it to be moved from the port of arrival into the EU all the way down to, to, to Italy and, and, and Greece, for example. So that's, a, that's quite a big change for them um, and has resulted in quite a lot of extra effort. The other areas, obviously, is that lots of companies that have never gone anywhere near customs. Um, as it was highlighted, I started as an industry when I was a spotty 16 year old. And um, I was uh, young enough then to uh, be on the other side of this arrangement when we weren't in the EU. So this is a complete re-engineering for my lifestyle, my lifetime. Um, so I remember standing there seeing French lorries come off and Spanish oranges coming in and having to do customs clearance for them. And here we are back to where we were then. Um, so import and export declarations are now critical for any movements going into the from the UK or coming out of the EU 27. And also on, uh, additionally, uh, areas of safety and security. Um, ever since 9-11, um, the US have been very conscious of goods coming into their ports and wanted advanced information. And the EU adopted something similar a few years later. Um, and that has now become something that we have to do because we're no longer part of the EU. So as we enter into the EU, a safety and security requirement has become necessary. Um, so for Northern Ireland, it has now got this sort of pseudo EU status um, to keep the land border um, open so that goods moving from Southern Ireland to Northern Ireland can move without any customs arrangements. And if they were moving from Northern Ireland directly to an EU country, so maybe going from Belfast to Rotterdam by uh, ship, um, that wouldn't be a customs movement either that would be an eu movement however um, goods coming from gb as it will be into the into northern ireland um, will be, be requiring a northern ireland import declaration fortunately not a gb export declaration as well um, and there are some situations when moved goods coming from northern ireland into gb will also require particularly excise goods so 
this discussion about where the border is now. Is it in the Irish Sea? It's probably more, more realistic that it is really. It's certainly not as a hard border. Um, but um, that has caused quite a lot of uh, disruption um, and complication for some people. Um, the government have funded a trader support service for a couple of years to help with that. And, um, but there's also been some confusion in the industry because another system that customs were developing called CDS has been introduced for the Northern Ireland Protocol scenario. So that again has caused quite a bit of um, uh, issues for the industry to, to deal with. There have also been some changes to the low value uh, arrangements for parcels as well. Um, and you may well have seen on the news that some online retailers are no longer now going to supply the GB through that because they're now having to pay uh, duty and taxes when they weren't before on certain values of goods. Um, and that's something that uh, the EU were going to do as well as the UK, but the UK have now adopted it as of the 1st of January. So that has made an impact on some of these um, online, online sales. And as, a, as that, that sort of extends there, as I say, to, um, to the EU countries, but uh, not necessarily some of the uh, non-EU countries. So from a, from a trader point of view, if you are uh, somebody that does do imports or exports, uh, you don't want necessarily to do those declarations yourself, although you can do um, as an importer or exporter, you are responsible. There's certain information that you do need to have and or if, or if you use a customs broker, you need to be providing to them. Um, this common number, this declaration unique consignment reference is something that is very important. It's a sort of key to the whole record. Um, the local reference number to identify the goods within your system. Um, and then obviously you need to have what's called an EORI number, an Economic Operator Registration Identification Number. Um, and obviously then some information about the goods itself. Critically, uh, the customs procedure code, uh, the commodity code, and the value of the goods are three of the most important things that you need to have. But obviously if there's issues with the product itself in terms of prohibitions and restrictions, i.e. licenses and controls like CITES, which is the uh, plants and animals endangered species type scenario, or if it's a military piece of equipment, it may well require a license. So there's some key information that needs to be put on the customs declaration. And, and whether you do that yourself as a trader and do your own declarations through the likes of our software, for example, or whether you use a customs broker, that information is required. So when you, when you are using a third party, um, I would also encourage you to ensure that you give sufficient paperwork and evidence that you need anything done specifically for your customs declaration. Um, so in terms of licenses, et cetera, and preference certificates, because it's very difficult to do that retrospectively. Um, obviously, if there's dangerous goods, an interesting one is that uh, bulk, bulk whiskey in a tanker is actually regarded as um, a dangerous good because it's extremely volatile, whereas when it's bottled, it's not so. Um, so it's an interesting one that falls into that category. Simon, could I just uh, interrupt you for a second? Um, I don't think your slides are moving on. Ah, so um, would you right. mind trying something else? Uh, yeah, OK. Let me... Thank you. I can hear you're clicking, but the slides aren't sort of... Yeah, Howard, you're on slide one still. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. OK. Mm -hmm. yeah. Howard, if you press share screen again, and it will ask you to share your second screen. I'll go to my desktop. Maybe that's the problem I'm doing. Let's try that. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to the beginning, what we do from current slides, see where that comes up. If I just move, are people seeing these ones now? That's better, yeah. Yes. Okay. So let me just run back quickly. So we touched on this one here. Hopefully you heard what I was saying and this is sort of firmed up what I was saying. Um, then I touched on this area here of the information that is very much required. We have a customs declaration now for any goods coming into the EU from the EU27 into the into UK and, and vice versa. Uh, I touched on some of the information that is important to go with that shipment, um, either out, particularly outbound or some, in some cases inbound. Obviously, if you're bringing goods in 
from countries like Switzerland, et cetera, you need a, a supporting preference certificate. And then obviously as an importer or an exporter now, you will be responsible for this information and um, customs will come knocking on your door for an audit. They won't go to a customs broker, for example. Um, they will come to you to check the information is being declared. So even if you do use a, uh, a customs broker, then I, I recommend that you do some at least random audit checks on what's been done on your behalf, because if you do have a visit from HMRC, whether that be a VAT audit, and they might ask about proof of export, um, or whether it's an import, and what you've declared your goods at, and what duty rate you've declared at, and whether the goods are appropriately um, qualified, you need to have this information to hand. So I would encourage you all to um, look at this information and make sure you have it. And the requirement is for a six year storage um, as well of this information that can be electronically stored and as long as it's in a retrievable format, customs should be happy with that. Um, what we've also seen is also a number of parties uh, doing customs warehousing, which is a customs bonded warehousing, particularly where it allows you to bring the goods in, um, suspend the duty and VAT on those goods while they sit in your customs bonded warehouse. Uh, so the goods are not technically in the United Kingdom at that point. Uh, and then when you're ready to remove them and pay those uh, for them to be into home use, i.e. You know, the UK market, or maybe even to re-export them, you can then bring them out and do the necessary paperwork and pay any necessary duties and taxes if it's an import. But obviously if it's an export, you've effectively suspended the duty of that inbound and then you re-export it out so you don't pay it at all. Uh, and that's become quite a, a critical piece of um, the tool set for some companies uh, since we've um, broken away from the EU. Hopefully my slides are, are moving okay now. Um, so uh, certainly, I mean, from a VAT perspective, and that may well be covered in, in later slides, I won't talk much too much about that, but you certainly need to be very careful about your VAT checks and uh, exports particularly. Um, customs do have a huge amount of powers, even more than the police. And um, they do have the ability to fine you um, for infringements. Um, mainly they are civil uh, infringements and they can fine you up to two and a half thousand pounds per infringement. Um, but there is also the scenario where it can be criminal penalties, particularly if you're selling, shall we say, military hardware to a country that we shouldn't be selling it to. Um, and ultimately, they can seize your goods as well uh, for the Queen's Warehouse, as it's very politely called. If, um, if you haven't already got the information, uh, what's being done on your behalf, um, what will be happening, what you can get hold of is this management support information. It's a sort of a monthly report that you are orderly or quarterly report you get from customs. You have to sign up for it, um, but it will show you uh, what's been done under your EORI number um, and therefore customers will refer to it. So it's good that you have it to hand as well so that you can do any necessary checks. So these are all areas that uh, people that have been importing or exporting to the rest of the world um, and not the EU um, have had to do for many, many years. But now of course, this also encompasses all those companies that have been trading with the EU 27 countries. One of the areas that UK customs have, have developed over time is a, is, a, is a trade facilitation called Customs Freight Simplify Procedure. You have to be approved to have this. Um, you have to also hold what's called a deferment account, which is effectively a credit account with the government where you guarantee to pay the money or your bank does on your behalf. Um, and they take the money out of your account every 15 days of the month. But it means your goods can be cleared very quickly at the port. Um, but this does actually allow, we're going to say that quick, clearance at the port and then a follow-up declaration later and that's quite useful for companies that have got lots of goods coming in at different ports and they want to consolidate those clearances um, so they can do immediate clearance under what's called a simplified funded declaration bring the goods in to their premises and then do later on within the fourth working day of the month of the goods coming in a supplementary declaration where they effectively pay all the duty and that so it gives you a bit of a time window and a sort of a delayed accounting sort of opportunity. Um, it's not applicable to all goods, as you can see on my slide there, but it is quite open to quite a lot of goods and can be quite useful for some companies. 
just thought to give you a quick little visualization of, of what now is involved in those processes. Um, if any of you are involved in imports and exports, um, this is the sort of process that's going to have to happen. Um, at the moment, um, UK government have decided to do what's called a UK transition period. So between January and July this year, they're allowing goods to come off the ferry at the ferry ports um, as, as, as they do now and do the customs declaration as long as it's cleared within 24 hours of the goods arriving um, to, to try and stop the M25 becoming a full-time car park or the M20, I should say. So they are allowing this sort of pre-departure and pre-arrival scenarios. So the idea is that the goods are declared into the custom system chief uh, as they're arriving in the EU port. Um, and then customs are aware they're coming. Uh, then they, once the goods are come off the ferry itself, the goods are then arrived into customs control, which then becomes a legal declaration. And the duty of that is, is paid. Um, depending on how you're doing that, to say with a CFSP or entry into declarant records, the IDR, um, the processes will be very similar. The, the hauler will have to do some information as well to make sure that the uh, the ferry is able to accept him on the ferry. They're supposed to be some due, some due diligence to make sure that the customs processes are taking place, and where appropriate, um, the safety and security information is being submitted. So going back the other way, so going out of the out of GB to the EU ports, um, a lot of talk obviously was talk, was mentioned in the news and everything about. UK leaving the EU, but what that also means is the EU 27 now have to deal with us in a different way as well. So as we've got these sort of ferry ports that sort of go from Dover, New Haven, Harwich, Plymouth to these EU ports, they are the first ports of entry into the EU. And therefore the goods have to be designated to either be cleared at that port and go into France or Spain or, 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 or Holland or moved through the EU uh, from that port and therefore a different type of declaration needs to be told because the customs at the port need to know whether those goods are being cleared there and then or whether they're being transited through those ports down to say Rome for example for clearance into it into Italy and again you know excise goods which is sort of effectively alcohol um, tobacco and uh, oils have uh, got more controls as well and anything that obviously does have any controls like live plants um, and animals, etc., will have extra controls to, to consider as well. But the idea is that you um, submit the declaration, you get your permission to progress, i.e. so the driver can go down to the ferry port and go straight onto the ferry. And again, this is in, a, in an attempt to try and keep things moving in the first six months. Um, and you've noticed on the news about these checks that are being done at the ferry ports, etc. So they're trying to ensure that all the paperwork has been done and is in place before they get on the ferry and before they get the other side and then get turned back, which will be logistical nightmare apart from the, uh, the other impact of costs and everything else. So here we have just a sort of a summary there of that sort of um, pre-departure import, lodging that import declaration, getting what's called the movement reference number, um, safety and security information, and then maybe a transit declaration to move it from the port inland um, and also maybe an EMCS movement to move it from the port to the final um, excise warehouse as well. So just in a sort of a little summary of what some of the things you may or may not need to consider, you know, some questions you need to ask yourself if you are thinking about this or whether you are uh, already involved in this, um, what sort of information I need. Um, yes, there may be a need for you to do your own declarations um, and many companies feel that they should be doing them and have approached us and we've signed up many to do that. Um, they will need to, to, to decide whether they're going to want customs warehousing, for example, whether they're going to clear the goods and pay the duty in that up front. Um, our software can provide those sort of solutions to help with that. Um, there's also in the UK what's called community systems providers uh, and you need to have a badge so that identifies you in those port systems, but also in Chief itself, the customs handling of import export freight system. So from within Descartes, we are a, a, a pan 
world uh, company uh, with a headquarters in Canada, actually. But we have uh, across Europe a number of custom declaration solutions as well, not just in the UK. The custom solution is the one in the UK, and we have uh, quite a strong presence in the Nordics and in the um, Benelux countries. And so we can provide solutions there as well, if needed. Um, but also we've got the global security filing solution as well, that is this safety and security messaging that's sometimes required. So we've got quite a lot of um, solution capabilities for, for the trade. Just thought I'd put together here some uh, useful links and uh, sources. The border operating model is constantly updated by customs. It really just gives an insight as to how they're expecting these things to work. There's the, uh, the tariff slide uh, link there, sorry, that um, will give you the information about some of these goods. And the good news is that many of the tariff um, goods have been reduced as well. So even if you're importing from um, a rest of the world country, not the EU 27, um, you may well find that if it was 2% or less, the duty rate is now zero. Uh, you may find that if it was 10.6, it's now been reduced down to 10. Um, so they've done a lot of rounding down in the government uh, UK tariff. So it's worth checking that out for your goods because you may well be pleasantly surprised. And then um, I had a, one co company that didn't realise that they were importing cranes that were built in Spain. Um, and it, it actually turned out that that had actually gone from 6% down to zero. So they were quite chuffed. Um, and then there's a number of other links there that might be useful. Uh, one of the things I've talked about, this EORI, Economic Operator Registration Identification, that is critical for you to do or for companies to act on your behalf to do to use um, for your identification to the custom systems. And um, there's also some other areas of links there, which obviously will be shared in the slides if, if, if that's the usual thing that's done on the webinar. And just a quick overview of some of the functionality of the UK e-customs solution, just to show you the, the sort of breadth of the situation that we can offer uh, in terms of customs warehousing or imports, exports and excise movement control system. Um, we, we probably handle about 35% of all the excise movements in the United Kingdom at the moment. And that's me. Hopefully that's given people an insight. Thank you, Howard. Uh, fantastic. Um, I'm sure you won't mind us. Uh, uh, well, usual rules apply that you, we will be able to share the slides because there's a lot of information on there that's useful to point people in the right direction. Our, you know, our clients and our friends of the firm who want to use that. Absolutely. Um, I, I will appreciate you doing that um, because, like you said, there's a lot of information on there. Some great slides, I think, on the um, where you were you know, demonstrating uh, sort of you know, in, in the diagrams, um, exactly what to do. And I think that was really helpful. Um, I'm sure our, our viewers will, will like that. So thank you very much. Um, Simon, do you want to um, move on with your your piece? Uh, well, I'm, I'm really here to support <laughs> Howard. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think there's any point in my repeating what he said. But um, yeah, I, th I think the key was at the beginning that, um, you know, so many companies missed the fact that there was all the talk around the trade deal and the trade negotiations which occupied the media and the headlines for for months and people missed that regardless of what the outcome of that was that they would still need to do um, import and export declarations as we left the EU on January the 1st uh, with the EU 27 countries and um, that's been a bit of a shock to a lot of businesses whatever reason and um, you know companies like ourselves were putting out a lot of information on that, as was the government, even doing TV advertising. But uh, I guess people were busy and preoccupied. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment. So, um, yeah. you know, if, if any of your um, listeners here would like information on that, we can, we can help. And we are helping a number of companies in that regard. So how, how desperate is the situation this week? How, how has it been? Have you had some news on... On, uh, on sort of, uh, yeah, has there, there been any problems or? Yeah, well, I think a lot of companies didn't uh, ship this first week. I think I personally think it's going to get worse as we get into the months. I think companies did hold back. Um, something in the early days were quite pleasant, I think, compared to what everyone was expecting. But as more and more people have started coming on stream, uh, a few cracks have appeared in some of the, in some of the systems and operations. Um, so, you know, safety and security is one of the ones that is, 
there's been a bit of a mixed message about that as to who's responsible for it. Traditionally, it's been either the shipping line or the carrier, you know, the likes of Hapag Lloyd and Maersk and British Airways and the Stanza when it's been rest of the world. And it was expected that the transport operator or the ferry operator would be the responsible party to follow that theme. But there seems to be a bit of a mixed message about who's doing that. So we've had some companies that have uh, been told they have to do it, which is a bit of an unexpected situation. So uh, someone and myself have been involved in, in sort of getting people set up with that global security solution. Um, so those, those are areas that have caught a number of people out. Um, I believe the, you know, the checks that are being done at the ferries terminals, you know, this big car park that they've created down at Dover has had a few trucks pulled over. Uh, some of the lorries have been turned away because they haven't got the right information, uh, the right documentation in place. But a lot of ferries have been operating quite well. So, but I think, it, I think it's probably too early to say whether everything is, is going well. Um, I think there's going to be some little more uh, sort of, uh, shall we say, cracks appearing in some of the situ situations for people because it's not all being fully tested, I think, to the, to the levels that we were expecting. I mean, we're looking at supposedly going from 50, 60 million declarations prior to us leaving the EU to something like 200 million declarations going through the system. So I think we're not quite there yet. So we'll have to maybe have another another one of these in, in three or four months time because <laughs> July is, the, is this end of this transition period when everything is supposed to be as it would be like the rest of the world. So that uh, mm. everything has to be cleared at the port and not allowed to leave until it has been cleared. Whereas at the moment they're letting the trucks drive off and do a clearance so it was in 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, thanks for that. I mean, we all saw the uh, the car park and the, the all the issues that there was going on just before, you know, sort of Christmas and, well, through to New Year, wasn't it, really? They were showing the... And then suddenly it all seemed to clear. And then, um, I mean, I know J Janet's from uh, from that way, aren't you, Janet? You're in... Uh, Absolutely. Sort of I don't think they quite backed up into your driveway, but... Uh, <laughs> they were pretty close. I actually... Yeah, I, I live quite close to... Um, over and um, actually the biggest preoccupation has been the retro coronavirus tests um, so I had friends li that live in Ashford trotting off to um, give Christmas dinners to the poor lorry drivers that were stuck there um, so I think actually that's maybe had the bigger impact and um, as Howard quite rightly said a lot of people had planned not to have to import um, for the first week or so it, it it will come later to see quite how much of a mess things are, end up being. Mm. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an interesting point about the COVID because again, France is insisting on all drivers having a COVID test before they get on the ferry. So that's another aspect that was not even planned about. So mm. um, yeah, there's um, you know that's causing extra hassles for people. Um, We'll have to wait and see how it all pans out, but uh, yeah, I think there's still some, you know, I think there's still some issues to come out of the woodwork, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, well, we're gonna, we'll, we'll have some questions in, in a bit. Um, do you, um, should we just um, move on? Do, do you want to talk a little bit about the VAT situation, Janet? Mm, um, and absolutely. Then we'll sort of get some sort of general questions that might sort of cover everything in in, in a little while. So, um, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. if we spend a few minutes talking about the, the sort of VAT situation. Yeah, I'm absolutely. So, so I thought I'd give everyone a kind of canter through the main um, aspects that have changed that people need to be aware of. I see on the, the Q&A um, uh, questions popped up on selling of small items. So we'll, um, we'll just sort of canter through the different areas. And actually that that's um, sales of small items, particularly if being sold through an online sales platform is one of the bigger changes. So um, that's that's definitely worth spending some time on in a minute as well. Um, so to start with in terms of imports, um, happily I don't in my practice tend to deal with um, customs so much, but I do deal with a lot of VAT. Um, so you know what's what's changed in terms of importing. Um, Effectively, and, th and this is interestingly, this is true throughout the whole of Brexit and how that works. In a way, we already knew how that was going to work because um, we already have a process there for what happens for um, non-EU goods coming into the UK. Well, OK, now the rest of the EU is um, or we are non-EU in relation to the rest of the EU. So we kind of already knew the procedure. What we didn't understand very well is how on earth Northern Ireland is going to work. Um, but I think that is now more or less bottomed out. Um, 
but in terms of importing and what that means from the VAT point of view, the, the key issue is, um, as again, as Howard said, we're going to have this kind of soft landing for the first six months or so, whereby effectively you'll still be able to import, um, but follow up quite quickly thereafter with the relevant declarations. Um, anyone really engaged in importing is going to want to have a duty deferment account. Um, so if they haven't already got that set up, um, that definitely needs to be on everyone's action lists. Um, and then thereafter, from a VAT point of view, if you're UK based and importing, um, really it's all about the procedures, getting your duty deferment account set up. Um, Northern Ireland, we'll come on to in a minute, that's a slightly um, different situation. Um, but for people in um, GB, um, your duty to form accounts are key kind of take home point that you need to organise um, and make sure you are well organised with your freight forwarder so you know who's doing what declarations, etc. Um, if you are outside of the EU and importing into the UK, um, then, you know, of course, your first question is, well, OK, you know, who, who's dealing with the import declaration? Um, is the party outside of the UK importing into UK and then onward selling? Um, or are they selling on the basis that the UK party um, acts as importer? Um, when you're dealing B2B, it, as a rule of thumb, it's always going to be easier if the party in country, so in our case, a foreign person importing to UK, it's actually always going to be a lot easier if it's the UK party that then um, acts as importer, because then you don't have to worry about the foreign party registering in the UK. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of people will operate on that basis unless they have a particular need to keep stock in the UK, um, in which case they may well do things differently. Um, what will really change though is this issue for um, particularly B2C sales um, of a low value, so under 135 quid. Um, now, for because you know, effectively, the government could see there as being quite a large scope for, um, frankly, avoidance or evasion, whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah, um, <laughs> where um, you know, it would have been the obvious thing that it's you know, it would be quite easy then for um, parties outside of the UK to just courier in goods, um, and frankly, probably no one would have bothered dealing with the um, VAT and import duties correctly. So, so they've introduced this requirement now, how well it will be policed will be yet to be seen, um, but there will now be a requirement effectively where you've got a B2C sale for um, under this 135 quid limit, it will be the vendor, even if they're outside of the UK, um, that is required to, um, in effect, charge the VAT still. Um, the UK VAT that is. Um, so you're going to have a lot more now non-UK um, businesses having to register in the UK if they want to enter into that B2C market. Um, the other um, area that dovetails into that is, well, okay, what happens if you're selling through an online sales platform? Uh, maybe you're selling through Amazon or something of that nature. Um, in that case, um, the government are putting the requirement on the online sales platform to collect VAT. Um, so Amazon's going to have to, um, hopefully it has already, um, but it's going to have to um, attend to a lot of systems changes so that each ensures that it is making sure that that collection is done. And if you think about it nowadays, particularly now we're all living in lockdown again, um, you know, who, who do you buy from online? A lot of the time is these sort of large um, online market platforms like Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, so I think, you know, like it or not, actually the revenue have been quite smart in what they've done in terms of making sure that it's Amazon and they're like that have to actually attend to the collection. Um, the other area that's um, for UK businesses that they're going to have to focus on is, well, um, what happens if, well, I might have bought goods from Germany, sold them to France um, without them actually coming into the UK? So all the while the UK was part of the EU, that could have happened relatively seamlessly under the triangulation rules. Um, so you, you as a UK business would have quoted your VAT number to your German supplier. 
you sell to you for your German VAT, you then sell on to your French customer um, and the French customer find they account for acquisition VAT. But from your point of view, there's no VAT to worry about actually collecting. Um, but however, now, now you're outside of the UK, uh, sorry, outside of the EU, um, that triangulation is not going to work anymore. Um, so there's now become a requirement in that sort of situation for the UK business to have to register somewhere in the EU, um, probably either in France or Germany, depending on the exact arrangements with the goods. Um, and there's also lots of other situations for, you know, what happens if you warehouse stock somewhere else in the EU, et cetera, that might give you a requirement to VAT register locally. Um, so that's something for UK businesses, if they haven't already, they're going to have to really focus on, well, okay, where's my stock going? Where else in the EU might I have to VAT register? And we're certainly seeing quite a number of practical um, complications with that, because if the UK business isn't otherwise established elsewhere in the EU, then there might be resistance locally to VAT registry. You might have to appoint a representative. Um, you might even have to kind of create your own establishment there to facilitate the registration. Um, so there's quite a lot of practical issues there that um, even now people are still working through. Um, so hopefully that's a kind of useful canter through of the main things that people are going to have to think through and work on. Um, but I don't know if we have any more questions that people well, can have. Can I just ask you one straight away? Because <laughs> you just said um, you could you register in, so if you were going like, the, you've still got your France-Germany situation mm -hmm. where you're, yeah, you're, you're being supplied Germany and then it's going directly to France. Mm -hmm. um, would it be, is, is there a better choice in terms of which of those countries you would, you would register for? Is it the one that where your goods are finally going to, or is it best to be in the country where you're supplying from? Or so, both? so the <laughs> technical answer is that it would depend on your terms of trade with both parties. Um, so when you, for example, if you're selling to France, at what point does title pass to your French customer? Is it passing whilst the goods are sort of in France or whilst they're in Germany? Um, so the, the legal answer is that it should depend on um, your contractual arrangements with both parties. Because if, for example, you buy the goods from the German uh, supplier, um, title passes to you in Germany, and then you sell the goods to the French customer while they're still in Germany, um, so in effect, all your transactions then happen whilst the goods are physically in Germany. The theory is that you should VAT register in Germany. Um, and, you know, conversely, if you're looking at um, selling into France. Um, what I suspect will happen in practice a lot, however, is that people will sort of think about, well, do I speak German or do I think, speak French, which is going to be easier for me? Um, so I suspect that will happen a lot. And in all honesty, will, will people sort of, notice that much for debate um but but the legal answer is that um yeah you need to look at where titles passing well, titles passing oh wow so we'll have to get a lawyer onto that one then <laughs> hopefully it's everyone in everyone's terms of sale because you've got all sorts of other <laughs> oh, issues we, like may have, we, we may have a lawyer in our audience who wants to ah. uh, in on that. You, know, you never know so we'll see um, <laughs> we've broken up so I was just going to just add a couple of things to that as well. Obviously, if you're importing into a, a, an EU country and, you know, um, the company that you're dealing with, they need to be obviously set up to do their imports. And if they're expecting you under your terms of shipment to do it, that becomes really complicated because then you would necessarily have to have a registration in that country. And France, for example, are very particular about having a registration and a sort of personal presence within the country. Mm. Um, as a representation so it can get quite complicated and just on the deferment account for those that are interested in that deferment account how it generally works is that your bank or some sort of a, a licensed financial institution can guarantee that money virtually um, your average industry thing is about two percent of that virtual money you have to tell customers how much you're expecting to expose on your deferment account and they then um, effectively hold that money on account because on the 15th day of each month UK government just come along and take that money that's been been set aside against the deferment account that's been submitted under your under the customs declaration. So that's that's how a deferment account works, and it's really the best way to go because the alternative to that is better to be cash, 
but back transfer these days, and you can back transfer to a, directly to an HMRC account, but it does delay the customs processes completely. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's just finding out all these partners to do these things, isn't it? You know, and I, I know Janet and I work with you know various different uh, um, institutions and organisations around the world to try and sort these things out. And it looks like that that sort of active work will be required a bit more. I mean, yeah. we had a, sort of a German Italy one that we did the other week, didn't we? Uh, mm. Where we were looking at that, and uh, it was there's a lot about processing in that one. I think uh, where where things where the product gets processed even because obviously. Um, you know, you get businesses that are buying somewhere, it's actually then processed somewhere else and then it could go somewhere else. So you could actually go through three countries. Mm. It'd be quite a complex arrangement. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I see we've got another question popped up. Yeah. Um, if our GB company received goods from the EU, will they need to put VAT on their invoice or do we have to sort it? So, so, be, so remember nowadays... Um, from a UK point of view, we don't much care whether it's EU or non-EU. From our point of view, it's um, an import into the UK. Um, so we, you know, in your situation there, you've got a GB company importing into the UK. The EU supplier um, is going to consider that an export. They're not going to charge um, VAT in their jurisdiction you're going to have to treat that as now being an import. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, in, in theory, pay import VAT, although probably you won't physically write a check for it. You'll deal with it to your duty deferment account. Um, but in theory, you will um, have to account for the VAT on import. Um, so it's, it's a mindset change now. Almost we, you know, we've got so used to thinking about, oh, are we importing from the EU or non-EU? Well, actually... Now all our imports are from the non-EU, um, so it's um, yeah, it's a very different mindset now to um, work through going forwards. Um, and I, I see there's another question, um, which is probably more duty focused. Might be one for you, Howard. Have you seen that one? Um, it says we are an SME making small food packets, sachets, etc. We bulk buy products like sugar and chocolate from the EU, process it, then export it back to the EU. Are there any special customs procedures for this, like IPR? Um, to which I think the answer is yes, but how would you probably deal with that more than me? Yeah, I mean, there is inward processing relief. Um, you need to obviously speak to customs to see where you would qualify for that. Um, Potentially also customs where bonded customs warehousing may be suitable, but if you're processing it, you'd have to make sure you get that qualified with customs because processing under customs control um, is a bit of an interesting area for customs. But um, I think those are two areas certainly worth looking at in with processing relief and uh, customs bonded warehousing and or could be both or could be just one or the other. Um, we've got a rather well-known um, uh, honey manufacturer that you know brings in drums of, of honey and turns them into blended honey um, and obviously that processing takes place so they have gone down the road of inward processing relief um, to get that advantage of suspending the duty and, and VAT on the import if they're going to re-export it back out of the United Kingdom so it's certainly worth exploring if uh, it's going to help with your costs as well. If, thank you, thank you, Howard. If it's not, I mean, this is probably a really complex, you know, question. But could you just sort of just explain a little bit about bonded warehouse? Because you, you know, mentioned it a couple of times, and sort of how difficult or how easy that is. Or uh, it, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's um, it's effectively saying that the goods can come in and it's effectively go into this suspended animation state, as I like to call it. So they come in in this space, bonded effectively. It's, you know, it can be a whole warehouse or it can be part of a warehouse. Customs assign that is that as these goods are then in this suspended state, um, and that say so that means the duty and VAT is not currently paid when you import them. So, say for example, goods coming in Southampton, you're going to say at the point of the frontier, I've now got a customs warehouse, bonded warehouse. I'm going to move these goods from the port. So you say to in the declaration, I'm moving these goods under this customs procedure code of bonded warehousing. So the duty and VAT is suspended at the frontier. You move the goods to your warehouse and you put them in and receipt them in through the customs warehouse system, through either a duty management solution of ours liking and or with a warehouse management solution. You put those goods into that status and they sit there 
ad infinitum until such time as you want to remove them. Um, and then when you remove them into home use, you then have to make a customs declaration and say, I'm now removing these goods and paying any duty in back. To get that process in place, you have to obviously approach HMRC. Um, if you're going to have it yourself, I mean, there are companies that obviously hold customs warehousing as, as third party operators and you can store stuff in their warehouse uh, you know, on, on your behalf. They will store it for you and do the necessary administration. Um, or you can apply to have it yourselves as, a, as, a, as an operator of the customs warehouse, as a trader. Um, it can take up to six months, unfortunately. It's been taking a, um, sort of 120 days is the official line, but recently there's been so much interest in it. You know, customers have been a little bit swamped. Um, and you do need to ensure you've got the ability to do these necessary customs declarations electronically through either the likes of our software or through a third party, et cetera. So there's, there is some there is some um, involvement in it. You do need to go through a customs warehouse approval process. Um, they will come and visit your site. They will go through your um, compliance history. They will go through your financial standing, and they will go through your security and controls at the warehouse. Mm. All right. So this could take a little time. I mean, I think this was what everybody was arguing about, wasn't it? The lack of time in organising these things when we didn't know what was going on. Um, so I think we're probably just uh, sort of going into that territory. So what what happens if? Um, so for instance, our, our you know our our uh, question there from Peter was uh, you know, about. So if he couldn't get this relief coming in, can't you know it's going to take six months to organise a bonded warehouse. It's going to take. What does it do in the meantime? Unfortunately, the only alternative is to pay the duty and VAT on import, and then you know potentially pay it again if you're in re-export it back into another EU country. That, that sounds like paperwork on top of paperwork. On top of paperwork. And, and cost, and cost, yeah, yeah, mm. indeed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the point, you know, the point that Simon was making, and, 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 and I'm not blaming anyone because I don't think the government have put that message out there particularly strongly. I mean, I think uh, Michael Gove a couple of times made a statement saying, deal or no deal, you will still need to do a customs declaration. But it didn't get the media attention that everything else got, you know, about fish, <laughs> you know, which is a small percentage of the whole situation. Um, so it, it's got, it's been, it's been left off the radar. So people have, there are people that we've had that have come to us with planning and proper planning and have got these things in place and are now comfortably moving forward. But others have come to us, you know, as of the 31st of December saying, oh, I think I'm going to have to do a customs declaration. You know, I think I need a customs warehouse. Can you help? You know, well, you're not going to get that until, you know, spring, mm. if you're lucky. Um, of 2021 and so you know the alternative is unfortunately either don't buy those goods or arrange to have those goods sold as, as we've talked about between the EU countries and some of our customers have decided to ship you know designate stuff that's coming into the UK bring it to the UK other stuff that was going to be shipped into the EU from the UK and now shipping it directly into Rotterdam have set up a customs warehouse in Rotterdam and then bring it into home use within the EU 27 so you know that's that's the only other alternative apart from the, the, the real nasty one of paying everything twice and doing two sets of paperwork. Yeah. And that, we, we, we ran a session just running up to Christmas, but obviously before we knew the answer, if you like, it was pre pre Brexit. We were all sort of wondering what was going on. And I, I, I looked up about a particular, you know, there's particular advice for particular products, isn't there? HMRC have put some quite detailed guidance. I was looking at honey and I couldn't quite believe the pages and pages of, you know, information on <laughs> how you deal with honey. And I, I, fortunately, I don't think we have got any fishermen on in our audience this afternoon who want to uh, this morning who want to ask a question on a particular fish because, as I understand it, there was a, a two thousand different species of fish that had to be uh, discussed. But um, <laughs> but certain pages on certain fish as well, apparently. So I mean, it was. Uh, but it, you know, it's very important to set some quarters, and I'm not dismissing because you know the fish industry have you know maybe suffered. I, I, yeah. In, in in the past as well, so I think they felt they they wanted to get their fair enough quota of yeah. fish within the English waters. So I can see the arguments for it, um, mm -hmm. but that dominated the media from the point of view of the hundreds of companies that were importing and exporting that we've sort of touched on today that have just forgotten yeah. that 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 requirement of a customs declaration is going to be needed. Yeah, you also mentioned that um, different. Um, so products they may have had their duty changed, the levels changed. How how would you one go? You know how how would you find out? How how do you find out what's what's gone on with your particular product? 
Well, there, on, the, on those links that you'll have and you can share, um, there's obviously the government uh, tariff link and you can put your commodity code in. I mean, it's critical, you know, as, uh, as, as Janet has sort of touched on, I mean, the deferment account and everything else, but that deferment account is obviously taking the duty and getting the commodity code right is then associated to that duty amount because that could be 10%, 4%, 6% or whatever. Getting that wrong, even if it, you overpay, and unfortunately some companies um, have gone for the thing, well, we'll overpay it uh, because then customers won't mind. But customers do mind when they come and do an audit, they will fine you either way because they see you're not taking your job responsibly. You should know what your commodity code is. So it's really important to get your product classified um, through other customs consultancy firm or whoever it is appropriate to do that. And some freight forwarders, for example, do offer those services. But get your, com get your commodity classified and get that commodity code. And for imports in the UK, it's 10 digits. And for exports out of the UK, it's eight digits. The first six of those are generally re recognized around the world under the WTO, WCO arrangements. But after that, they get very nationalistic, shall we say, at the tail end. But that can then have a difference where they fall within the tariffs and what duty rate is applicable. So it's really critical to do that. And there is, you know, the .gov site, there is a global tariff site out there and you can do a comparison. Um, and we're doing one in comparison what it was with the EU and what it was with the GB. As I say, they did go through this process of rounding down a number of, uh, of existing duty rates. So, you know, there are some good news items out there for some commodities, um, but others have maintained their, maintained their duty rate. And it's really important that you get that right. And if you've got a very particular product, I mean, I, I sometimes talk to the UK fashion and, um, uh, and textile industry, and they've got, you know, very specialised sort of silk garments that have got, jewels in them or whatever and it can be very difficult to um to define is there is a thing called a binding tariff that you can get um which allows you to get that specifically designated for your particular product because of its makeup um and therefore you can then share that with everyone to make sure you're using the right one so you know okay. if anything else from today a bit like uh you know sort of homework is to check your commodity code get your classification of your goods ensure if you are giving instructions to people what customs procedure code because you touched on things like ipr that's a different customs procedure code to just permanently importing something um, and so getting that right makes a big difference um, and then obviously um in making sure your yori your gb or yori is declared properly on the declaration as well so it's you that's known as the importer or exporter because if the back people come along as Janet will know and say, well, where's the evidence that you were the exporter of these goods? You, you're claiming back zero rating on this product. I've got no evidence here to show me that this is being exported and you, that, or it is exported, but this is not your trading company on this on this declaration. So I'm going to fine you and I want the back that you um, haven't paid. And that's 20% off your bottom line that you weren't expecting. No. Well, no, th thanks, uh, Howard. I, I just feel a, a little bit of a duty to answer all the questions here. Uh, excuse that. Um, that question, just to, I don't know if we can answer this. The VAT question, coffee, tea, sugar from the EU to the GB. Is it still 20% VAT? The government website links go around in circles. I mean, that's, I mean, the, that's not changed. And, and anyway, that stuff I'd expect to be zero rated. So I'm not sure about it still being 20% VAT. I'm not sure it would have been to start with. Um, but um, but in any event, none of the zero rating rules have changed as a result of um, right. what's gone on with Brexit. Um, so, yeah, which whatever foodstuffs had a particular rate, I realise they're not all zero percent, but yeah, none, none of the foodstuff rates have changed. As a result. Exactly. It's really changed. So whatever you were doing before is probably still in place. Yeah. But what is important there is that on the actual import declaration, there are rates that have to be declared. You have to declare your tax lines on, on the customs entry. And there is a zero rated one. There is a standard rate one. And there's also one for fine art, which is a reduced one. Um, so there are specific duty rates or VAT rates that need to be declared. And then the method of payment, like the deferment account. So that has to be quite well documented on the, on the declaration. And again, that's part of that, you know, good practice to have that auditing of your customs entries if someone else is doing them on your behalf that they're putting in the right information gosh and i, and I see we've got a fantastic maybe final question um do, do we think that changes will be increased due to the covid19 and brexit um so so the first thing is to say that brexit gives us free reign on 
where we set our VAT rates. So whilst we were within the EU, it had to be within certain parameters. Um, now it doesn't. Will it go up? I mean, for sure, they have to raise taxes somehow. Um, when you look at the maths of what collects the most taxes, um, you know, if you look at a pie chart for the different taxes and what collects most, it's absolutely income tax and VAT. So if they want to raise a lot of money, the chances are one of both of those will go up. Um, there are other things that politically will probably go up, um, like capital gains tax. Um, but the reality is they don't anyway collect as much money as income tax and VAT do. Um, there are also you know, other things being looked at. You know, there's a wealth tax being looked at, but will a Tory government really introduce a wealth tax? Jury is out. Um, but if they, if they really want to raise some money, that is an obvious target. And it would be a relatively easy thing to do. Um, you know, we've already seen that rate changes in the relatively recent future. Um, although it's it's a faff for businesses to do, it's certainly not impossible. Um, so it, it would be high on the list of things to change. And I think, Janet, I'm right in saying that really, you know, EU VAT levels as well for registration were a lot lower than ours. Um, yes. Before, especially in France, I think you only had to turn over what's it, twenty thousand pounds or something. I, I not know the exact number, but but the, the point is that our threshold's still quite high for rent, for VAT registration as well, isn't it? Oh my God, yeah. thousand is it something like that? I think it is. Is, it, is that sort of figure, Janet? Yeah, it's, uh, I think eighty six or something these days. But I I can't see the VAT registration threshold changing, although it has already been eaten away at a lot because, for example, you've got this issue with B two C importers into the UK effectively having a zero that threshold uh, that registration threshold so it's it's been eaten away a lot but for your average kind of tradesman in the UK who you know just does his own thing and you know he's been beaten to death by Covid anyway that would not be a popular political choice to um, decrease the VAT registration threshold for the likes of him um, and and anyway the admin of trying to deal with that would be quite high um, but another percent or two on the VAT rate, it would be fair game. One, 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 good, one good story out of this is that while COVID-19 has been going on and PPE has been the be all and end all of gold dust for lots of countries, um, the EU and the UK have introduced a number of statements on the declaration where you can actually get that imported for duty-free needs. So mm -hmm. there has been some movement on that in terms of trying to allow goods to come in specific specified commodity codes that can be applicable uh, for that duty-free importation. So they've tried to do their bit in, in that regard as well, just to sort of add the sort of good story to the end of the yeah. <laughs> But I mean, certainly from a duty perspective, and they, 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 they collect, you know, billions of duty uh, money and, um, you know, having, having, um, having duty rates lowered as they've done, I don't know whether the Treasury will realise that that's going to be another source that they're not going to have revenue coming in and you know here we are in Topsy Turvy world where we got this sort of it was Janet mentioned you know conservative government that have um sort of taxes wise but would we have seen a Tory government ever do furlough <laughs> so you know is uh, we're living in a very topsy-turvy world as far as I can see yeah okay well um I think we're gonna have to wrap it up now Janet thank you so much uh for joining thank us you. today um I think um it's quite it's quite obvious what you can help with people I think um, as always, you know, if you want to access um, uh, uh, Janet's team and Janet's services, obviously come to, you know, come to me, get in touch here at Ward Goodman um, and we'll put you in touch with, uh, with Janet's expertise. Is that OK, Janet? Perfect. <laughs> and um, obviously, Simon, we haven't heard a lot of, uh, from you in the last few minutes, but <laughs> would you just like, I mean, I presume, you know, if, uh, if any of our viewers um, want to access you, how, how are you happy for them to uh, for me to put you in touch yeah absolutely so um you know it, it is a confusing world we recognize that for people um as was said earlier a lot of people have delayed uh, bringing their imports into the country um so there's been this sort of quiet period but we think that's going to ramp up it has to in the next few weeks so if people have uncertainties about import export declarations use of transits um, or any other 
things like deferment accounts, um, then we can uh, we can get in touch and uh, we're very happy to help. OK, well, thanks very much, Simon. And thank you, Howard, for your presentation. Much appreciated. Great content. And um, and, and we look forward to seeing you again. Perhaps yeah. in, like you said, in a few months time when things are. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, maybe another one in July or something or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. Uh, we, yep. you know, WG Hub Live will return again shortly. Uh, so please look out for our next invitation to join us uh, for some more inspert, you know, insights and expert commentary. If you want to get in touch, um, I'm ian.rod at wardgoodman.co.uk. Um, so please, uh, please get in touch. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.